from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Today, we have invited you for a very special program, and our partner in this program is an organization called Everybody Wins DC, and they have helped bring you here and will be giving you a special gift at the end of the program, a book from the author, Jared Prozaska, who's right there. And Jared is from Worcester, Massachusetts. He's come a long way. And he's, he, he brought uh, a guest with him, his daughter Zoe, if she could raise her hand. She's in the other room. Yeah. She's in the other room. Okay. Yes, yeah. Hi. United okay. States. Jared is a very famous author who's written a lot of books. He's written several series. One is called the Lunch Lady series. There are ten of those. <laughs> you know the lunch lady. Yeah, you came alive. <laughs> the one you're going to hear about today is the Platypus Police Squad series, of which there are four, and there'll be another one out next year. He's also written a memoir. Maybe he'll tell you what that is. That's coming out in 2017. We also have two other special guests because the Platypus is about police officers. So the library has Capitol Hill Police who work with us and take care of us and make us safe. And we have Richard, Officer Richard Webb and Officer Renee White. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Okay, so here's Jared. Thank you very much, Karen. Hi, everybody, how are you? Good. Good, well, I'm so glad to be here with you. My name is Jared. I'm an author and I'm an illustrator. So I write the words and I draw the pictures. And I feel lucky enough that I get to have my books published. And I've written several picture books, the Lunch Lady graphic novels, the Platypus Police Squad novels. But for me, it began a long time ago. It started when I was a kid, when I was writing books in elementary school. When I was third grade, eight years old, I wrote this book in class. How many people here have ever written a story ever in your life? Raise your hand if you ever have. In class, or even a little short story, not a whole book. So I, I, ho well, I hope you guys realize that you guys are authors too. Yeah, I, I see more hands going up. You, I know you have. I know you have. So this is, this is where my career as an author began. It started with me writing stories in school when I was a kid. So I don't look to the first book that was ever published as to where my career as an author began. I look to the first book that I ever wrote. And the first book that I ever wrote, I wrote when I was just about your age, a little bit younger. And it was called The Owl Who Thought He Was the Best Flyer. The book had a cover. You open up the book, the first thing you saw was the title page. You know, you get the name of the book, the name of the author, some information about the publisher. And it was a story that was told with words and pictures. And that's exactly what I do today for my job. My job today is to tell stories using words and pictures. Now, words and pictures are teammates. Words will tell one part of the story, and the pictures will tell another aspect of the story. So when they come together, they tell the full story of the book. And sometimes you might decide they're going to work alone because maybe part of the story will be told with just the words, but likewise, maybe part of the story will be told with just the pictures. And the very last page of my book was the About the Author page. You know, the page in the back of the book where you learn about the author. And I had one when I was a kid, too. I hope you guys have them in your books. And it read, Jared lives in Worcester, Massachusetts. He goes to Gates Lane School. He liked making this book. And I love that last sentence. He liked making this book. Because I loved using my imagination. And that's what writing is. Writing is using your imagination, but on paper. So as a kid, I loved writing so much that I wouldn't wait for this to be a homework assignment. I'd get home from school. I would take out pieces of paper. I'd staple them together, and I would make my own books. And this wasn't a homework assignment. You know, uh, none of my grown-ups at home were saying, hey, Jared, it's time to write a book. I just wanted to be creative. So in fourth grade, I wrote a book about an egg and a tomato and a head of lettuce and a pumpkin. And I, they were best friends. They went to a haunted house. 
where there were dangers around every corner. There was, there was an evil blender that wanted to chop them up. And there was uh, an evil toaster that wanted to cook them. There was an evil microwave that wanted to melt them. And I would have so much fun making these stories. So throughout my childhood, whenever I had some free time, I would use that free time to write and illustrate. I would make my own comics. I would share the comics with my friends. And I loved seeing how people were entertained by these stories and comics and books that I was making. And when I was in college, I kept writing. I kept getting older. I kept writing. I then got real serious about saying, this is what I want to do for my job. And so I started sending my work to publishers. And you know what they said? They said, we don't really like your work all that much. Here's your book back. We don't want to publish it. And for two years that happened. For two years, I mailed my books out, and they came back with rejection letters. And I would write another story. I'd mail it out to another publisher. I'd come back with a rejection letter. But eventually, after two years, I had a book published. And it was called Goodnight Monkey Boy. And this big publisher, they took my words and pictures. They put it all together in that book. They made copies of that book. They sent copies of that book out to schools and stores and libraries all across the country. And so now kids were reading books just like I was a kid reading books, you know, back in the day when I would find the books at my local library, the school library or the bookstore. And I kept writing, and I had more picture books come. So Punk Farm, Ollie the Purple Elephant, My Buddy Slug, Baghead. I had the Lunch Lady graphic novels. There are, there are ten books in this series. It started with The Cyborg Substitute, and it kept going. And, it, and the last book that came out was The Schoolwide Scuffle. And now I'm in the middle of this world of Platypus Police Squad. And Platypus Police Squad, they're novels. They're very heavily illustrated novels. And they're about these two detectives. There's Detective Rick Zango. He's the hotshot young rookie. He plays fast and loose with the rules. And he's partnered with Detective Corey O'Malley, who's sort of like the old timer, plays it by the books. He's a bit of a curmudgeon. He's a total grump. Total opposites. They need to learn to work together to keep their city safe. Now, like all of my books, there are a ton of illustrations that complement the words, and the, and the pictures do help tell the story, but in, in, this, in the novel, the, the words are really taking the lead and telling the story about these two guys. Even there, Detective Corey O'Malley, he always has to drive. He does not let the rookie drive ever. So this is where the series came from. I had a book come out called Punk Farm. It's a picture book about these farm animals that are rock stars. And a whole year before that book was published, I would end my author presentations by drawing a picture of one of those farm animals with their big aviator sunglasses. And I would ask the students to guess what they thought my next book would be about. And they all had these different ideas, and they, and they were all incorrect. But one idea that kept coming up was students thought this was a story about police officers. They, they had those rock star sunglasses. They mistook those sunglasses as that being of a, of a cops. And so I, I thought, well, maybe I could do something with that. So I started writing a book called Penguin Police Squad, about these two penguins that were cops. They're curmudgeon old timer, the hotshot young rookie, and they were penguins. Same names and everything. And I filled my sketchbooks with these penguin characters explored their penguin home lives and how they would be different from one another. I thought about the other citizens that would inhabit this penguin city. I went to the New England Aquarium and I, with my sketchbook and I went to the penguin exhibit and I drew the penguins, I studied the penguins. But then after a year of working on Penguin Police Squad, suddenly penguins were everywhere. Everywhere you looked, there was a, there was a penguin documentary it was called March of the Penguins. It came out of nowhere, and it was like the biggest thing at the time. There were multiple animated movies starring penguins. I mean, these penguins were surfing. These penguins were tap dancing. These penguins were spies. There was an online video game about penguins that was very popular at the time. And I was talking to my manager one day. He helps me you know, take the, my ideas and bring them to the publishers. And, and I was talking to my manager, and he said, um, you know, nobody wants another penguin story, right? Penguins are just done, they're, they're played out, like they're, they've had their time in the spotlight. Nobody wants another penguin story. And I was really, as you can imagine, I was crestfallen. I was sad because I'd spent all this time working on Penguin Police Squad. But I took a step back and I thought, well, what did I love about the penguins? I loved, I loved the way it sounded, Penguin Police. 
Does anyone know what that is where two words start with the same sound? It's called alliteration, where two words start with the same sound. So I thought, okay, I like, that alliter I like the alliteration. I like that penguins are weird. I like that they are unlikely heroes. So I thought, what other animal starts with the pa sound, is weird, and would make for an unlikely hero? And I thought, oh, the platypus. And in my sketchbook, I started sketching out these platypuses. And now, once I said, oh, it's a book about platypus cops, I thought, they don't all, not everybody needs to be a platypus. You know, before every character was a penguin here, I thought, there could be a singer at the nightclub, and she's a flamingo. She's a horrible singer, but nobody says anything because her boyfriend owns the club. He needs this panda who no one's sure if they can trust. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a kangaroo, and there's a koala, and there's a, there's a hippo who acts as, like, the security guard for the, for the business panda. And I put together a pitch, an official document that says to my publisher, hey, this is my idea for a new book. And I was lucky enough that uh, Walden Pond Press said, hey, let's, let's, let's publish this. The world needs a good platypus cop story. And I was, I was, it just worked out so well. So I then got to, to writing the story. And when I'm organizing my thoughts in my notebook, I put together what's called the story mountain. And I sort out what's going to happen in the beginning of the story, and then the rising action, and the climax, which is the biggest moment of the story, the falling action, and the resolution. And I'm just brainstorming. Have you guys, I'm sure you brainstorm in class, where you get all of these ideas out of your head and onto the paper. And I get to writing. And I was so proud of this first draft. I mean, I had written picture books. I had written graphic novels. I had never written a full-length novel before. And I'm saying this, this Word document was just, you know, thousands of words long. I, I had never worked so hard in a story in my life. And I sent that manuscript, that first draft, into my editor. And you're just like, you know, you guys pass in your papers, and your teacher might make a few comments and make some marks, and you have to rewrite, and you have to edit and revise, and you have to write it again. You guys, you guys go through that, right? Yeah, I go through that too. So here, here are the first two pages of my editor's letter to me explaining why my story was not working. I want you to take note. This is single space. This isn't a double space document. <laughs> Here are pages one and two of my editor's letter explaining why the story wasn't working. Here are pages three, four, and five. And then here are pages six, seven, eight, nine, <laughs> 10, 11, 12, and 13, single space explaining how oh, I, I just, I had it all wrong. I needed to, to take another look at my story. I had to throw away about 90% of everything I had written and while that's, that's tough to do, sometimes it has to be done if you want to get your story to the best place possible. So I kept writing, I kept revising, kept getting notes back from the editor. But eventually, the story was in great shape. And then my publisher, they take my, the story that I've written you know, in a Word document, and they plug it into the design of what the book will be printed at. So I get to see, okay, the, the words will be this big, about There'll be about these many lines on a page. And now I, I reread that, and I start making sketches in the margins of what do I want to see in the art? How do I want to embellish the story with the art? And we'll plug in the sketches that I've made into, into the story, and we see how the words and pictures are flowing. And then I get to work on the final artwork. And to create the final artwork, I take this special paper, it's called bristle board, and it's how I make the art for the Lunch Lady books as well. And I use pencils, and I use a brush dipped in ink. And it looks something like this. I start by just drawing out the characters. And I'm using this special pencil, it's called non-photo blue. It's a special shade of pencil that the computer can't see. So what happens is I take out my ink, and I dip my brush into the ink, and I draw the final line work. And I, I draw with a brush because you get a very dynamic line when you draw with a brush. That line goes from thick to thin. Now, when I scan this artwork into my computer, the computer will only see that black line work. It won't see that special shade of blue, that non-photo blue. So I don't have to go through to erase all of the pencil marks for all of the art from the book. Now, this art 
that I created by hand, I scan into my computers, I can see it on my computer screen. And in Photoshop, all the shades of gray get plugged in, and it all gets bound up in a book. Now, from the time that, from the time that I started thinking about Penguin Police Squad, to the day that Platypus Police Squad was published, it was about nine years. So it was several years of brainstorming. I was sometimes I was, wasn't sure what to do with this idea. I didn't know what kind of book it would be. At one point, I thought maybe it's a picture book. The story kept getting longer. I thought maybe it's a graphic novel. And I thought, you know, I'd like to maybe try to write this as a novel. So there are, there, there. See, there, there's the Frog Who Croaked. That was the very first book. And there's the ostrich conspiracy. There's Last Panda Standing, which everybody will be receiving a copy of today. And just today, the cover for the fourth book was released. And it's called Never Say Narwhal. And this book will be out in May. And it'll be the last book in the Platypus Police Squad series. So I'd like to bring a chapter from Platypus Police Squad to life. And, and, and I, sure, I could, I could have just opened the book and read it to you, but I thought it would be more exciting to have some reader's theater. Reader's theater is when actors you know, create and bring to life a scene from the book. So we have here, from the United States Capitol Police, we have Officers White and Officer Webb. They're going to be bringing our characters to life. Now, uh, one character... Is, a, is an old curmudgeon grump, plays it by the books, and one is a hotshot young rookie who plays fast and loose with the rules. Did you guys decide amongst yourselves yeah. who was going to play yes. what character? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so if you would please uh, pick up your chairs, and, and the chairs, they, they, we're now this is going to be transformed into their unmarked squad car. And this is from one of the opening chapters from The Frog Who Croaked. It's the two detectives are working together for the first time it's their first time in the cop car driving together. As I mentioned earlier, Detective O'Malley never lets anybody else drive. <laughs> Detective Rick Zango is very excited. I mean, put it this way, how many people here have a younger brother or sister at home? It's kind of like that, right? Sometimes they kind of maybe get into everything. Now, how many people here have an older brother or sister at home? And don't they think they know everything? Yeah, sometimes, right? <laughs> And Karen Jaffe, who is the director here at the Young Reader Center, is going to play the part of the narrator. And while this is all going on, I'm going to be right here recreating the illustrations from that chapter. Okay. So on the count of three, you guys will be the directors. And you can say, you can say action, but you can give it a little more flair, and you can say action. You guys ready? Okay, ready? One, two, three. Three. <laughs> Veteran Detective Corey O'Malley has a new partner, rookie detective Rick Zengo. This is their first patrol together, driving in their unmarked squad car. Zengo can barely contain his excitement as they drive to the docks. The unmarked squad car is totally sweet. There are sirens in an intercom and a flashing light that can be struck on the roof with a magnet. The squad car is even outfitted with the most up-to-date laptop. Zango eyes the police van radio and the dashboard like it's his birthday party right there in the car as he looks at it. The radio crackles to life with a radio voice. Car 153, officers on the scene are requesting an update on your position. Over. O'Malley, eyes on the road, reaches for the mouthpiece, but Zango is quicker. That's a big 10-4 dispatch. Car number. Give me that mouthpiece. <laughs> Car 153 here. Coming up on the Coliseum now. We're pulling into the shipping area in six minutes. Rule number one. Rookie, no one touches this radio but me. Got it? Zango slumps down, frustrated. They're probably moving about five miles an hour. He hates being stuck in traffic. 
the Kalamazoo Coliseum looms large up ahead, and a huge billboard beside the stadium reads, it's your chance to name the new home of the Kalamazoo City Sharks, Pandi a Pandini project, your sharks better. Look at the billboard. What is it with Pandini? I can't get him out of my fur. He's been pretty busy the last year or so. Traffic slows to an even slower pace, making the traffic problem worse. A huge crowd trying to get to the ticket window has spilled out onto the street. What's up with this? Pandini is selling off parts off the old stadium to raise money for the children's hospital. Totally forgot that was happening today. <sighs> really? A children's hospital? What? You don't think sick kids need medicine? It's a win-win. The hospital gets the funds it needs. The Dahart sports fans get its piece of history. And the new stadium is going to be beautiful. I think it's great that our athletes are getting a stadium that they and their fans can be proud of. And the tickets are... By now, the squad car has stopped completely. Zango taps his foot. They're never going to get into the docks. He wishes Mel Malley would do something. Or maybe it's up to me. Zango slaps the light onto the roof and flips on the siren. The cars in front of them instantly start moving out of the way. And like a stampeding herd, the crowd outside the Coliseum scatters, shoving and knocking one another over. What are you doing, rookie? Maybe that wasn't such a good move. Zango turns off the siren. Sorry, partner. Thought you were in a hurry. It's rule, all. Rule number one. I'm a senior detective in this car. I say how fast we go. Not you, especially when I'm driving. I thought rule number one was no one touches the radio but you. Rule number two. We're on a case. We're trying to travel below the radar here. You want everyone in town to know that we're the cops? The key is to keep low, keep a low profile as possible. Got it, rookie? Yeah. Yep. Rule number three. As this is where your real education begins, Junior, we need to stay tuned in at all times. We stay focused on the city, listen to its sounds, smell its smells, feels its pulse. We need to know what it's thinking, anticipate what's thinking about to do next, to know what to do next. Detective work is, detective work is about using your instincts, staying a few steps ahead of the unexpected. Yeah, I know, but. No buts, detective. Work is all about keeping your bill to the ground. <sighs> old lady. What did you just call me? A little old lady? That's a lot of... Are you even listening to me, rookie? Little old lady crossing the road, O'Malley. Watch out. Zango pulls at the wheel, and the squad car swerves just in time. O'Malley's heart rate quadruples. Sweat pops off his head. He unbuttons his jacket. Yowzer, that was a close one. O'Malley glances in the rearview mirror. Sees a little old lady shaking her cane. Zango folds his arms and smirks. What was the last bit about paying attention? This radio crackles again. Where are you? 153. You're taking all day. What's your ETA? PDQ. He flips the siren on, throws the light onto the roof, and steps on the gas. Rule number four. You got to know when to put the pedal to the metal. They're expecting us at the docks. As they finally speed through the streets, Zango thinks. I would have been there a half hour ago. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Ready? Let's say and scene. And scene. Yeah. <laughs> Good work, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.
Does the Library of Congress have a community theater program that you guys could enroll in, too? <laughs> thank you so much for being here. Thank you, well, thank you guys you. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have a question for me or for the officers that are here? You'd like to ask? Yes? How do you draw without messing up, without like the blue nine or nothing, and you just draw and don't mess up anything? Oh, I mess up all the time. <gasps> it's not about getting upset that you mess up. It's about when a piece of artwork isn't going the way you want it to, you just make some changes, that's all. How, how do you get creative and draw that quickly? How do you get creative? Well, you know, I pay attention to the world around me, and at the same time, I zone out. So. You know, I might see something that inspires me in reality, and I just have to take some time to be alone with a sketchbook, alone with my thoughts, which is pretty difficult today because there's something to look at and something to, to view, and there are phones and computers and screens, it's, but yet to be alone with a sketchbook and just draw and let your mind wander, and that, that's how I get creative. That you told her real rules that you would tell her. Are those are those? Uh, is that how they would really talk in the car? Is that how you'd really talk in a squad? Would, car? Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. We kind of laid back. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, guys, thank you so much for spending some time with us at the Young Reader Center today. What a what a gift for us to all be at the Library of Congress together. I had a wonderful time, and I hope you did too. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.